currently, I believe you just had a baby. Is that right? Yeah, I had a baby a few months ago. Um, Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, everything's everything's great. And yeah, it's a real blessing to live in Australia, honestly. Um, we First world problems everywhere. You know, we like to complain about everything, but really we've got it pretty good here, I think. Yeah, compared to your story and what you went through, I can only imagine like the the level of like blessings you must have and the level of gratitude as well. It's surprising how quickly you go back to complaining about the traffic or the weather or whatever. <laughs> you know, you'd think that you would put everything in perspective and that, I mean, I do remind myself, come on, you know, think about that Iranian prison you were in, like this is nothing, don't complain. But um, it's amazing how quickly the brain snaps back into old habits of, you know, the barista gets your coffee order wrong or whatever, end of the world. <laughs> And really, you know, um, I didn't have coffee for two and a half years um, in prison and that was much tougher. So, yeah, it's um, that's that's how our brain works, unfortunately. I'm still complaining about everything as I was earlier. So it's a fascinating thought process. I'm, I'm curious, do you have you looked into why that is the case? Like when you've been through something that is rather horrific by a normal person's standards, like I think it's pretty horrific what you went through. But then you get reintegrated back into society. Is it because like you've found a level of comfort that you somehow forget all the things? Or do you really forget? You do. I think like any bad thing that happens to you in life or any memory really at all, um, with the passage of time, the, the sharp edges get sort of worn down and you you stop remembering the detail of of everything and I think when it's a tough memory or a difficult period in your life um, it's a survival mechanism or a coping mechanism maybe to sort of round off those edges and or forget entirely whether that be deliberate or not some people deliberately want to forget and they just don't think about it and don't go there in their mind but others I think in my case you don't dwell on it, but it's still there in your your brain. But I guess it's part of trying to move on from it and move past it to not let it keep coming up in a really like present way every day or whatever and just get on with living your life. So I think it's like a, a, a very typical survival mechanism, no matter what kind of traumatic thing you might have gone through. Yeah. And what sort of happens when a memory does sort of come up in your brain and you are triggered? What do you do nowadays? I'm not really triggered. Um, I think I, I'm i proud of myself for having an attitude at the very beginning. And indeed, when I was still going through it, when I was still in prison, um, I was always very open about how I was feeling and never put any of my experiences in a box in my brain and threw away the key, you mm. know, so that that could trigger me later on. Um if something reminded me of that, I always wanted to talk openly about what happened to me and indeed talked with my cellmates, uh, talked with others in the prison about every aspect of what was going on, even the painful stuff from the beginning. And that openness has meant that I'm, I think I'm not triggered because nothing's kind of surprising or shocking to me. Um, so if I think about stuff and sometimes I will be reminded of prison and, and things will pop up in life that sort of make me think back um, to what, whatever it could be mundane or it could be a big deal or whatever, but something that happened to me in prison, um, I, you know, process through the memory, but I don't feel that I'm being triggered by it necessarily. That's really good to hear because I know a lot of people would, I guess, claim the victim. Like I've been through this kind of situation, woe is me kind of ordeal, look at me, look at my situation. It was terrible, but mm -hmm. it seems like you've taken the complete opposite route of that. And I'm interested in what good has that done you in doing that and taking the, the very different approach? I, when I look, look like I learned a lot from being in prison about myself and about, I guess, the human condition or the human mind in a way. And some of that was about my own mind, but it, a lot of it was also observing the behavior of others and, particularly um, in a prison I was in called Qachak for three months, which was a public prison largely populated by regular criminal inmates. There were 
a handful of political prisoners like myself, but the rest had been convicted of regular crimes, even murder um, and armed robbery, drugs offences, this kind of thing. So there were some long-termers in there, people who had been given significant sentences, even the death penalty and were on death row. And the death penalty guys were just in the rest of the ward like everyone else. You know, they weren't on a separate ward. So you got to know them too. Same with the murderers, everybody. Um, and some of them were lovely people. Um and in Iran, you have to sort of take it with a pinch of salt anyway. I'm sure many of them were innocent. Uh, but anyway, you get to know the mentality and the behavior of people who had been living under such sentences or had been living in prison for a long time with no prospect of release, you know, for another 10 years or so. Um, and I think their attitudes taught me a lot. Some of them did kind of wallow in victimhood or wallow in this woe is me kind of mentality. And you could see they did not come off well because of it. They were obviously depressed and, and had everybody has mental health issues in prison, no matter what their attitude is. But, you know, like some of them just were so relentlessly negative and, you know, barely got out of bed in the mornings, were so like self-absorbed. They didn't sort of help others within this prison community. They didn't participate as much in, you know, keeping the, the ward going because it is a community, a self-sustaining one in a way. Um, and I sort of very much made the conscious decision not to be like that because I could see it's a sort of a black hole you fall into and it's very difficult to get out once you've fallen into it. Um, and I was determined not to be a victim. Um, I was determined to learn as much as I could during my time there so that the time wouldn't be wasted. And also that I wouldn't come out being sort of a broken shell of a human being and knowing that that's, you know, that that kind of sustained me, I guess, that that was what I wanted to be. And I, I definitely don't see myself as a victim and I don't want to play the victim card um, in life henceforth either. Um, and I think that's been a, an important part of my recovery. Were you raised in a household that taught you this kind of value? No. Um I don't, I wasn't raised by helicopter parents. Um, maybe that has something to do with it. My, my parents both worked very long hours, um, you know, in, in working class jobs. Uh, so I was sort of, um, I don't know, like left to my own devices, really, especially in high school. Nobody was sort of checking up on me, monitoring me, breathing down my neck, you know, telling me what grades I should get or what subjects I should take or, you know, um, I would take myself off to school on my own in the morning and get my little brother and, and my sister ready for school too when my mum, you know, would go off to work at 6am and my dad was a shift worker so he'd often not be around in the morning. So I guess I, I was taking responsibility for myself from a fairly young age and, and didn't have that kind of micromanaging um, parental experience a lot of kids have these days. But I was never raised with specific values, you know, of like don't be a victim or whatever. Let's go back to the very beginning and you are now an academic, Dr. Kylie Moore Gilbert. And what is your doctorate essentially? What, what do you study or teach? I, um, I was lecturing in Middle East politics and my PhD was also in yeah, Middle East and political science, uh, focusing on the Shia communities of the Arab Gulf states. Um, so yeah, like I studied Middle East, I did my undergraduate degree in Middle Eastern studies in the UK. So I've been studying the Middle East for a long time, um, several periods of field work or, or living in the Middle East and language study in the Middle East and, um, never Iran though, um, always the Arab world and Israel. So, um, that was actually my first trip to Iran and I'd never, you know, studied the Farsi language or written, published anything about Iran prior. Uh, to my trip there as well. Uh, but yeah, so um, I was teaching a few subjects at Melbourne Uni prior to my arrest. Um, one was sort of Islam and politics. The other was um, the history of the Middle East in the 20th century. And another was examining um, the so-called Arab Spring movements. So um, 20, end of 2010, 2011, um, in, in much of the Middle East, those uprisings that happened. What got you interested in wanting to study the Middle East and doing Islamic studies and the political nature of all these things? Such a fascinating part of the world. Uh, it's so dynamic. It's always changing. I, um, 
never really knew what I wanted to be when I grow up, quote unquote. I still don't really know. Um, I was a big backpacker in my youth. After high school, I backpacked for several years and traveled around the world and um, spent some time in the Middle East then traveling, really loved it, uh, was fascinated by the languages in particular. I love learning languages. So that kind of was what sparked my interest. And um, I got into this degree program for the Middle East. And part of that appeal was that I got to live in the Middle East for 12 months um, or for the, the third year of my four year undergraduate degree, which for someone who loved travel and wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do yet, I, um, you know, I thought that would be a great, like a, a lot of fun <laughs> for me back in my early twenties. So, yeah. So I kind of fell into it in a way, but, um, I think it's just a really fascinating part of the world and a, and a great thing to study. For those people that aren't sort of like, in the know when it comes down to the political side of, I guess, the Middle East and what goes on there, would you be able to do like a, an ex- explanation of what are some things that we need to know about the political system in the Middle East? And is it important to know? Well, one important question. <laughs> Well, that's the subject of many books and many university courses. Um, so it's difficult to give you a sort of a quick summary. But um, I guess if you're looking at the political systems in the Middle East, bar one or perhaps two countries, um, the Middle East is a sea of authoritarianism. So dictators, authoritarian regimes, um, a history of military coups in a, in a lot of countries, um, throw into the mix the rise of Islamism, so political Islam, um, using the, the Muslim religion uh, as a sort of a lens to practice politics and order society, uh, which emerged in the 20th century, um, but has its roots a little bit earlier than that. Um, and that phenomenon kind of swept through the Middle East and saw many countries there, which are all majority Muslim bar Israel, really, um, and Lebanon to an extent, um, saw sort of either the countries outright rejecting or the, the leaders of those countries, dictators say outright rejecting Islamism and kind of waging war on it, um, or being overtaken by Islamism and becoming kind of Islamist fused political structures. Um, so, you know, Saudi Arabia, for example, and states in the Gulf like Qatar, uh, like the UAE, um, have a very, you know, strong religious flavor to their governance. Um, although they wouldn't be Islamist per se, um, or, you know, you could argue the Saudis are, um, and the Qataris. Then you have countries like Syria and Egypt, which, um, had uh, military coups and and rulers that were fighting against the Islamist trends within their country and trying to suppress and persecute those who wanted to see you know Islamic law or whatever instigated in you know in their societies. So that very much sort of um, impacted the entire region really, um, and still does in a way. And you had the growth of jihadist terrorism as an offshoot of the more extreme elements of that as well. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but they're, they're, these are the kind of political trends in the Middle East. At the no, moment. It's helpful to understand in the broader context of things, especially in the Western Hemisphere, because we've got our own political system. But it's interesting how Islam plays a huge role in their political system. And have you looked at why that is the case? What is it about Islam specifically that makes them sort of want to e- include this religion within and out of their political system, especially if it is like authoritarian, it's a dictatorship, there's a lot of uprising, that sort of thing. And even though they claim like it is a peaceful peaceful religion, I know it might seem like it's rather controversial me saying that, but it just seems like there's a lot of tension within that. So it's fascinating to me how they've got this claim that it's peaceful, but then they've got a lot of tension I don't know. Mm. Am I going somewhere here or no? Yeah, yeah. I think that point's been made <laughs> by many. Um, I think the, the, two, the two things I'd say is the rise of political Islam was a response to the failure of other systems in the Middle East. When you have hardcore authoritarian rulers suppressing the people, you know, uh, re- preventing freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of religion, freedom to practice your religion in a very religious way, which a lot of these Islamists want to do. Um, 
then that leads to a backlash um, against that, which is which is what Islam was, Islamism, sorry, was um, in many of these very authoritarian, secular, post-military coup or post-monarchy countries. So many of these started off as monarchies, absolute monarchies, with a king, you know, Egypt, Iraq, um, you know, and, and you still have kings in places like Morocco and Jordan too, um, arguably, you know, the the sheikhs of the Gulf are also kings, even though they don't call themselves as such, other than in Saudi. Um, so you had sort of absolute monarchs being replaced in many of these countries by military absolute dictators, um, and the people never had any freedom and and you know and any rights. They were sub- subject to these dictators. So Islamism sort of seemed like an appealing alternative um, because you know the other point I'd make is that Islam isn't just a religion in the eyes of many, it's a whole system of ordering society that, you know, you have Sharia law, you have an entire legal code that could be potentially followed and and applied in the nation state context. You have courts, you have judges, you have political structures that can be kind of assimilated into a government structure. So it's a whole package. It's not just a set of religious beliefs. So it lends itself inherently to structuring society or governance under it. Um, Unlike Christianity, where we don't have Christian law that's sort of codified in a way that's accepted by everyone, for instance. You have maybe the Catholics have their own laws and codes, but, you know, it's all very splintered into different sects in Christianity and there's no sort of holy law of Christianity um, that can be compared to Sharia law. Um, So it would be very difficult to order a Christian country according to a Christian set of laws. Um, But Islam is very different in that, you know, aspect. So um, that's what I'd say, that it's a reaction to the failures of other government governance types. Um, Democracy hasn't really been allowed ever in many of these countries in the Middle East. And so Islamism was seen as an alternative that could make society better and and freer and less under the yoke of some authoritarian ruler. Um, But of course, unfortunately, in many of these countries, and Iran is a good example of this because Iran had a revolution, it overthrew its, um, its king, its shah, replaced it with Islamists and got an Islamist dictator in the end instead. So it's, it's been shown, you know, unfortunately that replacing, you know, what what came before with Islamism just often yields a similar authoritarian result rather than a democracy or some other system. So I think it's falling out of favour in some societies now in the Middle East because it's been shown, okay, religious rule is no better than, you know, secular military coup rule or or other, you know, kings and, and, and monarchs. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think that was the appeal in the 20th century. It was a new way that potentially was better for society than the authoritarianism that they'd been used to. Are the Islamic regime, are they mainly following the Quran, the letter, or are they taking certain points and then just expanding their own viewpoints, let's say, and just creating their own kind of system based on certain little elements of the Quran? Yes, uh, I would say all... Islamist regimes interpret the Quran and Sharia law according to their own whims, um, which, you know, they they ultimately want to stay in power, keep maintaining their grasp on power is number one priority. So religious law and religious ideas are quite slippery and nothing is super uber. um, Some things are set in stone, but when it comes to how you run society, often these um, these things are a matter of interpretation. So you can interpret it in the way that, you know, these rulers would see, would maintain their grip on power. They, you know, uh, this is human nature the world over. Um, and in Iran, it's, it's actually interesting because they're Shia Muslims, which is a, a minority sect of Islam. The majority is Sunni Muslims. And their, their sect is more open to flexibility of interpretation than the Sunni sect. So you have... Ayatollahs, the the top religious scholar, kind of like a pope, but they have many popes. There's more than one. Um, They're considered to have reached, there's several hundred of them in the world, and they've reached the highest pillar of scholarship. These guys can issue new religious laws or new religious edicts, fatwas. 
Um, so it kind of keeps it dynamic in the present day. It's not all set in stone and codified 100 years ago or something. Um, but it means that these ayatollahs can be very political themselves and can just issue religious laws and edicts based on the regime that's in power of the day and, and their interests, which is what we see in Iran. We see religious scholars being used by the regime just to oppress the people, maintain their grip on power and to just put a religious justification over everything, basically. Um, so that's why they're so hated and um, Islamism is now rejected by the majority of the people in Iran because they can see, okay, this is just another layer of repression for us. Mm. Kind of like whatever flavour of the month, so to speak, how I'm feeling one minute, I'm going to make it so and everyone has to follow along kind of deal. Yeah, yeah, basically. It sounds like to me yep. and it's kind of like this power grab as well because they know they've got an immense amount of power people are going to listen to them because they're forced to listen to them so i guess human nature often dictates that when they're given an incredible amount of power what are they going to do with it they're usually going to abuse that power to their own whims i mean it's like we've seen it all throughout history haven't we it's mm. fascinating when you look at history i mean even in uh, christianity as well the Catholic Church, I mean, the Crusades, similar thing with that. Like they all they all took the power thinking that they were doing the right thing under God mm -hmm. and look what happened with that. So many people died as a result. And then it's now we've got uh, people following the Bible from a more moral and uh, virtuous standpoint, I guess you could say. And then having a sense of freedom and looking at people the way that they are as people, like one law under God, so to speak, be kind, be live as Christ would live. He was the ultimate example of that. Whereas the Islamic people, I guess, on, on the other hand, taking the Quran and I, I don't know, I don't know a great deal about it. You probably know more than, than I do. And they've sort of, you know, kind of taken it a little bit to the extreme, which I, I guess some Christians do as well. Like they're, they're, guilt, they're not totally exempt from it. You either. have extremists in every religion, I think. You know, yeah. you look at some of the Christians in the United States in particular, some of them are pretty crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> like I wouldn't like, I think, you know, and you, Buddhists in Myanmar are, are committing genocide against the Rohingyas. You know, you, you have them in every religion. You have Hindu extremists in India now under um, the BJP party and President Modi, you know, firebombing minority religions, temples and mosques and, and other sites. And, you know, it, unfortunately, us humans seem to be so something in our <laughs> psychology that lends itself to extremism at times and, you know, pretending God is on your side is an excellent excuse to be able to do whatever you want, really. So I guess that's why it emerges. And we've seen it in, in Islam too, but majority of Muslims obviously aren't extremists at all. Um, and most of them would be against the Islamic extremism we've seen in recent decades as well. Mm. I wanted to give my audience context regarding the Islamic uh, political system because I believe Iran, where you were imprisoned, is extremely uh, Islamic and there's an oppressive regime going on there. Um, I've heard some people say that it is a dangerous place to be, while other people have sort of said it's a beautiful part of the world, it's a beautiful place, it's not so dangerous. Uh, which side of the aisle do you fall on having been imprisoned? Obviously, I would say don't visit Iran, um, certainly not as a tourist if you're from a Western country. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. It has immense potential for tourism, beautiful like archaeological sites. You know, you've got all of ancient Persia and that incredible empire um, there. I, you know, I went to Persepolis. Mm -hmm. When I was um, when I was in Iran, and that's incredible. One of the wonders of the ancient world. Um, you have beautiful old villages and mosques, and just stunning landscapes, amazing culture, great food. It has everything. Hospitable people. It could be a tourism capital of that region, but unfortunately, the regime that's in power right now um, is in the business of taking Western people hostage and and using them as bargaining chips in its 
diplomatic endeavours. And as a result, um, even though it's very unlikely, statistically speaking, to happen to you, if you visited Iran as a tourist or you had family there and you were going back and you were visiting, unfortunately, this phenomenon is on the increase in Iran. Um, we saw only yesterday five Americans sent who had spent up to seven years in an Iranian prison, uh, traded in a prisoner swap deal with the US only yesterday. Um, and these people languished there for years and years in horrific circumstances, um, only to be finally released. So I just think it's not worth the risk to travel to such a country. And I'd tell anyone that if they asked me. So what happened to you? What landed you in Iran in the first place? So I had never heard of Iran's hostage diplomacy, which is what we call it um, prior to my travelling there. Uh, this was back in 2018. It was sort of just around the time of just after Trump had pulled out of the nuclear deal. Um, and prior to that, Iran was sort of an up and coming tourist destination because the nuclear deal was seen to have opened it up a bit. And, you know, perhaps relations with the West were improving and Iran was safer now. And, you know, that was the kind of zeitgeist at the time. Um and I went there for an academic trip. I'd been invited by an Iranian university there to attend a conference. And um, as an academic here in Australia, you know, attending conferences was pretty normal. I always wanted to see Iran. I heard it's a beautiful place, an amazing country. And I thought, great, well, this is a good opportunity for me to go there. And, you know, my trip was only two and a half weeks. That's as long as I thought I'd be there. Um, and I had a great time right up until my arrest. So, yeah, um, I, I I went there to attend an academic conference, essentially. Why do they arrest you? Uh, they arrested me ultimately because I had value to them as a diplomatic hostage. But how I came to be sort of flagged on their radar is a bit more complicated. Um, I go into more detail in the book on that. Basically, somebody sold me out who I'd encountered in the course of that conference that I attended and um, sort of flagged me on the radar with a group called the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps or IRGC. Uh, they are a kind of a started off as a militia group inside Iran and now have become a kind of a state within a state. Um, very dangerous violent people kind of associated with the Iranian state, but not part of the government. Um, and they are the ones that arrested me. So I, I got unlucky in that I, um, yeah, like spoke to, interacted with somebody who was linked to them unbeknownst to me at the time. Did you say anything that made the person want to and like rat you out? I don't know why he ratted me out. I, most of my research at that time was on Bahrain, which is another country in the, the Gulf. Um, and this guy was a Bahraini guy living in Iran. So I had a chat with him and wanted to interview him um, about the situation in Bahrain. So maybe, you know, I, I have a few theories. I know it was him that ratted me out because the Rev guards told me. The, yeah. the people who arrested me um, and, and through his behaviour, looking back, I could see that that was the case. Um, I don't know whether he got arrested himself for something. Um, and then when you get arrested, they go through your phone, they go through your emails, they want to read and, and check up on everything. So then they would have found messages from me and his phone and, and said, hey, who's this random foreign chick you've been meeting with? That's one possibility. Or the other is that he just got some sort of benefit by maybe he was an informer on his own community, on the Bahraini community in Iran, um, was informing for money, say, to the Revolutionary Guards on his fellow community members. And as a result, you know, already had those networks and just added my name to his informing. Um, or maybe he himself got in trouble with them and just sold me out to buy his way out of a sticky situation. I'm not sure. Uh, and I don't think I'll ever know, to be honest. You didn't have any diplomatic immunity whatsoever being a citizen of Australia? No. Um, citizens of Western countries are seen as valuable hostages in Iran. Now, wow. now I understand this. At the time, I didn't. Um, you know, I thought, oh, well, Australia has no beef with Iran. You know, we have fairly positive relations. If I was an American... That would be a different story. You know, Americans should not travel to Iran. They have no diplomatic relations. The two countries hate each other. You know, don't go there. But yeah. for Australia, I thought, okay, well, you know, we've 
we've got an embassy there and lots of Aussies go to have been to Iran. I, knew, I know people who've been traveling in Iran myself, several people. Um, and I thought, oh, you know, it'll be fine. They don't, nobody really has any beef with Australia. But um, the IRGC, this group that took me hostage essentially, they view all Westerners, particularly Europeans, Canadians, Americans, Australians, they view them all as being the same. They're all kind of like Americans, essentially. Western devils. Um, yeah, and they they know they can extort us for something in exchange from our countries. So um, it did help being an Australian and not an American, um, but at the end of the day that the approach was the same. So nobody told you any of this before going? No, um, and DFAT's actually added a travel advisory to their Iran-specific advice saying there is a danger of being arbitrarily detained or arrested in Iran. Uh, but that didn't even exist when I was, when I travelled there. So, And this uh, is only 2018. Yeah, yep. <laughs> so it's not that long ago. No. That this actually took place. No, I was released in November 2020, so less than three years ago. During COVID of yes. all times. I know. You went from one prison to the next almost. <laughs> I did. I went into hotel quarantine. So I was let out of an Iranian prison, flown back to Australia and put straight into hotel quarantine for two weeks. Oh, <laughs> so my goodness. A luxury prison cell it was. <laughs> did that feel like freedom? No, but I think it was positive in the long run. It would have been quite uh, confronting to be sort of just thrown out into society straight away, um, having been used to prison for so long. So actually it was a good opportunity to decompress and not sort of a trickle approach, little by little approach, rather than um, just having Australia unleashed on me the second I touched down. So I'm kind of grateful for the quarantine, even though it, I didn't feel like I was free. I mean, I couldn't leave my hotel room. I couldn't go and see my family or my friends. Um, it's still eased me back in, I think, which was, in retrospect, it was good. Mm. Two years not seeing your family and friends and then to get so close, you're in the country and then yet so far away from them, that would be soul crushing in many respects. I had a friend in Canberra because I was in Canberra in quarantine there um, and a friend of mine happened to live there and she used to come stand underneath the balcony of the quarantine oh. hotel, like a few stories down, and we'd have a conversation over lunch, you know, just shout up and down at each other, <laughs> which was great. You know, it's the first friend I'd seen since I was in prison, so I was so happy to see her. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that was as close as I got. I don't mean to take you back to, I guess, the horrific memory of you being actually arrested, but what was it like? For you to be arrested, did you know what was going on or was it just all a blur for you? I didn't believe I was really being arrested because, like, it was, a, I guess the I was arrested twice, actually. Um, mm. The first time I guess I was detained, I could say, it was at the airport when I was departing the country and it, I was just on my way to passport control and they pulled me aside and took me into an airport interrogation room um, and I thought that it was just a, an interview in the in the airport room and that they would let me go and I would be able to um, catch my flight and it very quickly materialized that I was going to miss my flight but I never it never occurred to me I'm being actually arrested and then I'm going to be stuck in Iran for years I thought okay there's been some misunderstanding I need to clear that up and then they're going to let me leave so I didn't really feel that I was being arrested I I was sort of thought it would be temporarily I'm being detained because there's some mix up and then they'll let me go uh, and so I guess I was arrested again. I, I mean, I was still in their custody the whole time. They put me in a hotel that was under their control and had their kind of monitoring devices, cameras and listening devices in the room. Um, and I was sort of imprisoned in that hotel room for a week um, and, and was interrogated each day. But because it was a hotel room, I, I don't feel, okay, I'm, I, I knew I was in deep trouble by that point, but I didn't feel like I'm you know, going to be put on trial or be charged with a crime or whatever. I still thought I'd be able to clear it up. 
Um, and so the second time was when they came and told me after that one week, we need to transfer you to another facility. And this time I was blindfolded. I was handcuffed and, and stuck in a blacked out van between two guards. And I knew, okay, this is, it felt like a real arrest at that point. And that's when they transferred me to prison. So I guess that second kind of moment was when it started to sink in for me uh, rather than the initial arrest at the airport. You're in two prisons, one in Avin and Korak. Is that it? Uh, Karchak. Kar- Karchak. Um, for you, how long were you in Avin before moving to the other one? I was in Avin for 23 months, so almost two years. Then I went to Karchak for three months and then I came back to Avin again for about two months or so, maybe a little bit less than two months prior to my release. And you were there for a total of 804 days, yes. which is just an insane amount of time. Was the government alerted to you being imprisoned or were you able to alert anyone at the time? I wasn't able to say to anyone I was in prison, but upon that initial arrest at the airport, I was allowed by my captors to send a WhatsApp message to my parents, my family saying they wanted me to come up with a BS kind of reason why I didn't make my flight. So they told me I had to say, oh, I've had this amazing research opportunity in Iran. I've decided to extend my trip by a few weeks. And I mean, I wrote it in a very formal English in such a way that it looked dodgy and I knew my parents wouldn't buy it. Um, And they knew that I had already checked in for my flight because I had messaged them and told them that I've checked in before my arrest. So it wouldn't have made sense for me to just check into my flight and then suddenly have this research opportunity spring up and and for me not to catch that plane. I knew that they wouldn't buy it, but I was able to send that message and they went to DFAT to the government with that and said, we think something's happened to Kylie. She didn't make her flight back and she sent us this dodgy message. Um, She's in Iran. Please try and find out. So I think they were able to get it on the government's radar within a few days of my arrest. And why did it take them 804 days to basically get you from the prison? Because Iran doesn't just give up foreign prisoners for nothing. They, from very early on, were trying to determine my price. They were trying to see how valuable I was, um, what they would be able to charge me with, but, you know, they they put you on trial in some sort of kangaroo court. They give you a sentence. My sentence was 10 years in prison. I was charged with espionage, which is ridiculous. But um, it's a common charge they apply to foreigners. And um, then they start the business of bartering something, you know, in exchange for you. So they, they weren't going to give me up without getting something significant in return from the Australian government. And that took a lot of time to put together and execute, uh, which is why it took more than two years to get me out. So they take you for no reason whatsoever and they expect something in return for taking you for nothing. (laughs) Yeah. They take you as an innocent person. They charge you with some bogus crime uh, and they say, okay, this chick's going to rot away in our prison for 10 years if you don't give us something in return. And This is something they've done many, many times. You know, dozens and dozens of foreigners and dual nationals in Iran have suffered this fate. It's called hostage diplomacy. And in my case, there were three Revolutionary Guard members um, who had attempted to commit a terror attack in Thailand against the Israeli ambassador. Um, And they had failed. In fact, one of them had blown off his own legs in the process. So kind of a blundering idiot of a terrorist, really. Um, But they had been sitting in in this Thai prison. And my guys that arrested me, they wanted their own members back. They didn't want just any old Iranian person in an Australian prison. They wanted their own guys. So um, they said to Australia, go to Thailand, convince them to release these three, and we'll give you Kylie Moore Gilbert back. And because we have good relations with Thailand, um, I don't know what we gave Thailand in exchange. We definitely would have given them something, but it would have been something more intangible. You know, we didn't do a prisoner exchange with Thailand. It would have been some trade or diplomatic cover or something that, you know, the Thais would have liked us to do for them um, in exchange for them releasing these three terrorists and sending them back to Iran. And then I was freed. So 
Australia had to put together this complicated deal. And they, to their credit, they did a really good job and they pulled off quite a diplomatic feat in the end. It just took them quite some time to do it. How does it make you feel now knowing that the Australian government did all that for you, that they would go to the trouble of going to the Thais and even having a good relationship with them, they still had to give something to the Thai government in order for you in return, knowing full well that these three terrorists or be bad terrorists are being given up and sent back to their own people to potentially who knows what's going to happen. I am very grateful to the Australian government for rescuing me, for coming to my aid. And I also feel very conflicted about the fact that these three guys are on the loose in Iran today. Um, There's quite grating footage of them emerging out of the airport in Tehran, getting wreaths of flowers put around their necks and being applauded and having dignitaries shake their hands. They're returning heroes. You know, these people, A, they didn't even do what they were supposed to do, which was this bomb plot in Thailand. They botched that. Um, And they haven't done anything heroic whatsoever. Um, They're just sort of idiots who tried to murder somebody, um, being treated like heroes returning to their country. I mean, that's very distressing for me to see. Uh, I believe Australia was given assurances that they wouldn't commit further attacks in the future, but that means nothing. I mean, we can't. Iran is a sponsor of terrorism. You can't prevent them from doing that if if that's what they want to do. And there's no way Australia can enforce that. But I would hope, given that their identities are publicly known now and they're, they're known to have been committing these crimes and have been convicted for them in Thailand, that they wouldn't be sent abroad to do any such thing again. Certainly the guy in the wheelchair who blew off his own legs isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Um, but it is it is a source of distress to me to know that these guys are free. They should be in a prison cell somewhere. Um, it's not fair that I had done nothing wrong and I'm an innocent person. I'd be exchanged for these guys' freedom. It's not fair. But um, I'm obviously very glad that the Australian government did do it in the end. Yeah. What was prison like? I mean, we've heard stories, uh, but the actual experience, did, did you feel like you had any kind of humanity at all or was that stripped from you? They try to strip your humanity from you. It's it's a very dehumanising place, prison. It's deliberate, certainly, at the beginning um, when you're being interrogated. It's a very deliberate strategy by your captors to dehumanise you, to make you feel small, to make you give up all hope, to make you surrender to them and give up all the information you have and and do anything they want you to do. They often put you under pressure to sign a false confession. That's the easiest for them. If they put you under so much psychological torture and, and pressure that you just give up, break and sign whatever they want, that's the easiest thing for them. They then just go to the court. They've got your confession. You get convicted, job done. And then they get to work with, you know, bartering over concessions for for trading you. Um, I refused to make a false confession, so they had to craft some sort of BS, sort of ridiculous narrative around me being a spy and try and find quote-unquote evidence of that that they could present to the court. Um, But the court was a kangaroo court anyway. It was a sham. Um, A revolutionary guard judge sat there um, who... You know, I use judge very loosely. He wasn't a judge at all. He was more of a thug. Um, And the whole thing was rubber stamped and waved through. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's very dehumanizing. And um, you have no power. You have no power whatsoever over your own fate. You don't even have power over your own toothbrush. You know, nothing. You can't decide anything for yourself. And um, even the most basic things like access to toilet paper or ability to see a doctor if you're sick are weaponized against you and used as a kind of a uh, a carrot in a carrot and stick approach to get you to play ball. So, yeah, it, it was a horrific experience, particularly in those first six months. Did you ever feel like your life was on the line at any moment? At the beginning, they threw all sorts of stuff around in the interrogations, like, oh, I could get the death penalty, you know, spies can get the death penalty in Iran. But I never really believed it. I didn't see any benefit to them for executing me. It wouldn't make sense. I think certainly a few months into it, I heard about Iran's hostage diplomacy from fellow prisoners I was in touch with. And 
these guys enlightened me. They said, look, whatever sentence they give you, it's not going to mean anything because you won't serve that sentence. They want to make a deal with your government because they want something in exchange for you. So just hold on. It's a it's a time game now. You just have to hold on for as much time as it takes for them to come to an agreement. Um, and normally that's a few years. Uh, but I knew once I understood that Iran engages in this hostage diplomacy that like, what use am I dead? What use am I being killed? Whether that be them killing me in interrogation or me being executed, getting the death sentence. I mean, they get nothing out of that, right? Like they would want to keep me alive so that they can exchange me for some sort of concession. So I never really bought it or believed when they did. They did threaten my life verbally, but I never believed it per se. And I heard that you decided to be a little bit of a rebel as well in prison. Is that correct? Yeah, I rebelled a lot. Uh, certainly after the first few months, um, when I started to be in touch with some of my fellow political prisoners, initially that was via like illicit sort of note passing networks that we set up or snatching conversation in air conditioning vents between ourselves from time to time when the guards went around. Um and then ultimately, after about a year, I was put into a cell with two political prisoners that became very close friends of mine. And we all started resisting together. We would go on group hunger strikes. I've been on hunger strike on my own too many times. Um, I managed to escape from the exercise yard of the prison one time, climbed up on the roof um, of the interrogation block, disrupted all the interrogations happening beneath me and managed to sort of stay up there really as a free person, you know, not for the first time, not having cameras on me, not having bars around or, or guards around. I was free to roam around the rooftops. And, um, you know, that was an amazing day for me, actually. Um, and I got a lot of concessions out of them in order to come down off that roof too. So that was a proud moment. Um, and we did a lot of misbehaving and um, sometimes it worked for us. Sometimes it backfired, but it also gave you a sense of agency that, you're doing something and you're not just sitting back and again being a victim of somebody, but you're taking matters into your own hands and fighting back and asserting yourself and asserting your personhood and your humanity too, um, to not letting them dehumanize you um, and, and just be, you know, a pushover or whatever, but fighting back against the injustices that you're being subjected to. That I think was important as well. So, yeah, um, I, you know, I'll go into a lot of detail in the book about it, but um, for me, it, I think it was an important part of coming out with some self-respect and dignity attached, uh, yeah, attached as well. Um, you know, was was by resisting my captors and and not just laying down and taking whatever they threw at me. Viva la resistance, <laughs> kind of <laughs> kind of thing. That's what I kept thinking about when you were telling me that, and then getting on the roof, <laughs> like. Yeah, look at me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was getting up to a lot of antics up there on the roof, definitely <laughs> <laughs> screaming a lot of stuff. <laughs> I mean, good on you for doing all that. Like, were you ever punished for doing any of that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was punished a lot. I was beaten up once. They caught me um, trying to smuggle a note to one of the doctors in the prison hospital. And unfortunately, this doctor betrayed me you know, he was on their side. Most of the doctors weren't on their side. They were, I think, appalled as doctors by what they were seeing was being done to prisoners of the Revolutionary Guard Corps that would be brought in to them. You know, I was on hunger strike at the time. I was quite emaciated. They'd put, they'd bring you in there and hook you up to a drip um, if you were really, really, um, you know, in a terrible state from the hunger strike. Uh, so this doctor, unfortunately, gave my note to the guards so then they beat me up in, in the hospital um, and then didn't, even though I was in a hospital, they wouldn't um, give places. me plasters or anything to put over my gashes or my cuts. I was bleeding and they, they wouldn't even bandage those up, even though I was in a hospital. Um, so, yeah, that was that was tough. But normally the punishments would be, um, well, I had all consular access cut off as a punishment. So even though under international law, you're supposed to have access to your embassy, your government can visit you in prison and provide consular assistance if you're arrested. Um, that was paused, cut off for I think nine or 10 months as a punishment for my resistance. Um, and likewise, all family phone calls, all meetings with lawyers or anyone were cut off as well as a punishment. Um, so yeah, they did all sorts of things to you, but to be honest, if you've got nothing to lose, then you don't care. Like I, after a while, 
you just accept whatever punishment, it's still worth doing what you're doing to sort of retain that self-respect and maybe win some concessions too. Carly, I've got to let you go back to your little one. Um, your new book or your book is called The Uncaged Sky. Uh, and I encourage people to go and get a copy of the book. Uh, you were freed November 25th, 2020, and you now have a child, I believe. So what's going on for you in terms of your life at the moment? How are you adjusting and reintegrating back into society? Has it been sort of seamless? Are you back to some sort of normal now? It hasn't been seamless at all. Um, and I think I'm still transitioning back. It's a very long process. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have a new normal for sure, but it's something that will remain with me for the rest of my life. And it hasn't even been three years that I've been released yet. So I think it's present with me every day still, but I'm at the same time making a lot of effort to move on with my life too. And I think I've done a pretty good job of that overall I've made a lot of mistakes too since coming out of prison but I'm really trying to be a normal person and live a normal life again it's important to me and hopefully a day will arrive in the future where I'll forget that Iran happened to me at all and I'll just be living that normal life and you know be a normal person again what do you mean by mistakes since coming out of prison oh all sorts of bad decisions (laughs) you know (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> things I would do differently <laughs> had you know because I was on such a high when I came out especially for the first six months I would just say yes to absolutely everything and do I did a few crazy things which I probably won't mention but you know just I, I was in a different headspace and I was reveling in my freedom and and enjoying myself maybe a little bit too much but I think that's just a normal response really um and now I've come back down to sort of a maybe a similar position or, or lifestyle to what I was living before and re-establishing normality again. Mm. Um, but, yeah, these things that sort of yo-yo around the place a bit still. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it does. And final question for you, what does freedom mean? Freedom is the most undervalued Thing that we have in our lives you don't realize what it means or how important it is until you lose it and thankfully most people never lose it so they just take it for granted mm. um but freedom is more important than the food we eat the air we breathe you know um i'm just so grateful to have been given a second chance at life and a second chance at freedom and i still really value and cherish that and i hope i always will Kylie, thank you so much for your time today, your story, your wisdom, your advice. I really do appreciate you being open and honest about something that happened to you. And I'm glad that you're not a victim and you've chosen the opposite. And anyone can go and get a copy of your book, wherever books are sold. I'll link it in the show description to make it easy for people. But thank you so much for joining me today on the Storybox podcast. Thanks so much, Jay. It's a pleasure to be here.